Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Inspire Leadership podcast. And I have a guest who I've had on for a second time. And that's quite unusual to have somebody on for a second time. It's because I've just been on a leadership retreat with him in Peru. And I've learned a lot of lessons from it. And I think because he does a lot of leadership retreats, he's on one right now in Croatia. I thought we could talk about that and some of the lessons learned. So without further ado, I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, thank you, uh, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Great to see you in Peru too. So afterwards and um, all of the developments that have, have happened since then. But my name is Stephen Cohen. I'm the co-author of Unleash Your Humble Alpha. Um, and that's also the name, the name of our retreat when we do go to Peru. And we have a business advisory program that also expands the consciousness in the business world in order to reach the goals that you want to reach in a, in a state of transition. So uh, we work with business owners and entrepreneurs to do that. Um, I live in Europe. I'm American. Uh, and uh, I love what I do. So back to the Inspiring Leadership Podcast with Jonathan Bowman Perks. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. No, I mean, firstly, thank you for um, just the inspiration of your book, Unleash Your Humble Alpha, I found uh, really resonated with me and uh, my own experiences, you having been a tank commander in war uh, and experienced an awful lot and then gone into business, been very successful in business, you have a, a an ability to be what people refer to as a powerful connector. You just have that ability to bring people together. And you did that in Peru. Um, it was such an eclectic mix of different people, yeah. um, which was, was fun. We'll talk about that in a moment. But firstly, let's talk about why why leadership retreats, why retreats at all. Um, I mean, I find them good, but but people listening to this who are thinking about a retreat, whether with you or any, anywhere else, why, why do you find them so useful, Stephen? Well, you know, each one has its own, you know, reason for existence and modality. Some people are looking for the surface, you know, changing things in the, in the logical side. Some people are looking for the internal, the subconscious. Some people are looking for just experiences to take them out of the, uh, their everyday mind. And for me, it's all about learning. So, you know, I, I have a thing that I want to be incremental better every single day than I was yesterday, incrementally better. And this is, a, this is basically a quantum leap when you come to somewhere like I am right now, in Croatia with 150 entrepreneurs from all over the world, um, including people like Vishen Lakani from Mind Valley, and you know um, David S. Asbury was a member, um, uh, just, just really high level entrepreneurs that have achieved a certain level of clarity and uh, they're teaching. And so if you have access to people like that, you know, people say all the time, if you're, you're the sum of the five people you hang out with, if you're the smartest one in the room, you got to, you know, change rooms. Well, if you're not, that, if you're not, you're not at the frequency of the room, you won't get let in or you might get in and people be like, what's this person doing here? Doesn't belong here because the frequency isn't there as a level of vibration isn't there. And so these retreats allow you to at ease meet with these people in a situation where they're not in their place of, of, you know, their power place and you're not in your power place. So you're, you're neutral, you're equal. And so that's, that's what retreats do in Peru. Exactly the same. I mean, you're a senior officer. We had NCOs, we had civilians, but we were all the same. And it allows you to let go of any of these preconceived notions and these structures that we have in our minds that we have to be because we have this title and do this thing. You just let go. And that's why they're so important. Yeah. It allows you to expand your consciousness. It really, really does. Yeah. I, I think that's beautifully put. And, um, for me, having been on retreats with sort of CEOs and different leaders, it, it is always a great environment for them to let down their guard as much as they're prepared to, to really do some work on themselves, but also their impact on other people to learn something. Um, and, and as we'll discuss later on, to, to gain clarity, to gain something from the retreat, to leave things behind that you no longer serve you, but also you come back with stuff you should have left behind, but you didn't. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, yeah, I, I do. I do think um, it was a profound experience for me and for the others. And you had a nice collection. You had nine guests, and you deliberately kept it. The maximum was going to be ten. Ten. Um, and and it, it seemed to work quite well, didn't it? Because there was that chance that everybody gets to know everybody else, and, and you could manage that with the ceremonies and the visits and things like that. Any other reason why you chose that particular? Kept it to a, a certain size. Well, yeah, it's, it's about the intimacy and such a, such a, you know, a retreat like we do, because when you're on, when you're on the plant medicine, you can let your matter of fact, you let your guard down, whether you want to or not. And uh, it sort of brings you into a place where if you're in a, a crowd of people, that's going to affect the, um, the impact of the medicine, it'll affect the impact that you're going to have on your consciousness. 
and how what you're going to take away. If there's people chatting and jer jerking and joking around, there's people that aren't paying attention or whatever. And so we keep it small and intimate. We try to mix it up. We don't want to ever do all veterans. That could be dangerous. Um, you know, we want to mix it up. We want veterans and we want civilians because I think veterans have a lot to teach the world, um, a lot. And I also think that the the what they teach is sometimes a little bit too harsh or direct. So the civilian side of it comes in and it allows them to sort of, you know, dull the edges a little bit through this interaction with each other and through the plant medicine where you can expand the consciousness and connect with other people on a truly emotional level and learn from them. Yeah. And um, someone said when I came back, they said, did, did you know anybody before you went? And I said, no. And they said, well, that takes a bit of courage to go and meet sort of 11 strangers and spend 10 days together opening up your heart and soul, your kimono, as it were, yeah. and letting them all in there and, and being okay with that. Um, and I went, yeah, I, su I suppose it does take a bit of courage, but it, it's, it's always worth um, stepping outside your comfort zone. And, and as you said, it was very nice because we were all travelers together. We were all equal. There was no status, there was no rank. And everybody had an interesting mix of stories. There were people from, well, we had people from uh, Kuwait, Canada, uh, a few from the UK. Um, the owners were originally from South Africa, um, uh, Australia, Central, Central America, Australia. It was it was a really Germany yeah. uh, and yourself yeah. from Hungary. Uh, yeah. It, it w was a real eclectic mix of global travelers, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it was male and female. And that's yeah. uh, also a part of it, because when we work with the different plant medicines, one's the ayahuasca and one's the San Pedro. Ayahuasca is a feminine plant the divine feminine and then um san pedro is of, of course the divine masculine and so not only do we work with the plant medicine you work with um the other energies as well with the people that, that, that you're on the retreat with so it's it's quite dynamic yeah and, and actually that's a lovely way of of capturing my, my next thought and our discussion point really was was about energy and uh the spiritual energy and and i'm a pretty practical down to earth kind of guy yeah. and and you were very much so. But I think you've become, through doing these plant-based ceremonies and through your travels and your studies, I think you've become more spiritual, but yet still kept your, your feet grounded solidly in the, in the clay, with our feet of clay, that we're human. Um, but you, you actually took us to some very sacred places. I mean, Machu Picchu, which is one of the world's number one travel destinations in popularity, places that people always want to go. And so many people say, oh, I so want to go to Machu Picchu in Peru. But also the, the mountain house where you had a stay, um, which was quite rustic, quite, quite basic, but comfortable enough. Um, and, you know, simple food, a, a, good, a good vegetarian fare, which was healthy for us all. Yeah. Um, and, but, but we were like 500 meters from the Temple of the Moon and, um, the San Pedro um, temple. Sort of temple as well. Uh, that was incredible, uh, just that it, it goes back, not just to the 1200s when the Incas were there, but, but probably a thousand or 2000 years before yeah. that, some yeah. of the, the places. Do you wanna say a bit more about that? Yeah, well, we, where we do the retreat is at mile one of the Inca Trail. It's uh, in the Sacred Valley, the beginning of the Sacred Valley. Um, and uh, the Temple of the Moon is literally, actually it's like, more and more like 200 meters away. Um, and then you have the Temple of the Moon, Temple of the Frog, Temple of the Monkey, Temple of San Pedro, Pachamama Birth Canal, Pachamama Womb, uh, just to name a few, <laughs> within a five to eight minute walk from where we are. And what that does is temples are always built on the highest energy sources. So even in modern times, churches, all these cathedrals, you see these massive cathedrals like St. John's or um, St. Istvan in Budapest, they're all built on an energy vortex. Like all churches are built on these energy vortexes. And so when you're in these areas and you're working with the plant medicine and you're out there after your, after your ceremony and you're going into these temples and you're, you know, uh, doing what you do there, uh, whatever that, whatever you choose to do, climb, meditate, sit, feel, touch, whatever it is, um, you're actually um, becoming one with the energy of that vortex and the earth, mother earth is what we call Pachamama. Um, and so it, it adds another dimension to just doing plant medicine, mm. right? Mm. And a lot of people, they go on these ayahuasca, uh, they call it ayahuasca tourism. And we work with ayahuasca and San Pedro together in order to create the complete 
um, journey, so to say, within and without. Yeah, I mean, it was phenomenal for for me as a sort of practical Yorkshireman and Englishman uh, to be in, as you said, I think it's quite a way to describe it, sort of these highest energy, energy vortexes that you you felt the energy in yeah. each of these temples and these places uh, in a way that when you combine that to the effect of the higher awareness that you gain from t- taking the plant-based medicine, like the San Pedro or the ayahuasca, um, it, it really was such an almost in-body, out-of-body experience that uh, everything seemed heightened, everything seemed clearer, but also very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is. It is very powerful. And when you let go, um, which you automatically do when you're in a medicine, you really feel it. Hmm. You remember we went to the Temple of the Monkey where you laid on the slab and you yeah. literally felt the vibration of that slab of, of a stone. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's real. Even, even non-believers where they're like, okay, I, I can actually feel something, you know, like, cause they're like, oh, what is this? You know? And they show up and they're like, wow, I actually feel something. Yeah. So, and, and it's you, you, if, if you were in a place of familiarity, let's say in your buddy's backyard or something, right? The refrigerator is right there. You can go get a beer. The TV's there, the remote control, the f- cell phone, it's all right there. So you're not going to let go. You, you, you can't let go. So when we take you out, into a place that you know nothing about and put you in these situations, you are completely free. You're not distracted with all the, the creature comforts of the world that we have at our beckoning call 24 seven. You're out there, you're dealing with who you are, your, your issues, you're working with other people, even though you're not, let's say you're not a therapist, but you're therapizing with, you know, your therapy for each other almost like I, we, I just listen to you and you mm-hmm. listen to me. We had some profound breakthroughs, just you and I walking mm-hmm. before we even went to Machu Picchu, like down in um, Agua de Galentes. Huh? Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, that's, that's what that comes. That's that integration period as well. After the medicine, it isn't just during the medicine, it's after the medicine where the real integration actually happens. Well, well, I, I think the way you set it up was beautifully done. Uh, and we'll talk about the itinerary in, in a moment. But I think particularly getting us all to think about before we came, what was our intention? What, what did we come wishing to address, to think about, to reflect on. Because um, too many people, I think, walk through life, um, sleepwalk through life. They, yeah. they, never, they never really wake up. And you could say, well, this was a sort of dreamlike state, but was it? It was probably an altered reality kind of state, but yet it was a greater clarity yeah. state. And I, I think it was very helpful, um, you know, that I, I went to Peru in, in my particular case, I wanted to be present and at peace and to love and accept myself and others without judgment. That was one of the things. I wanted to embrace an adventurous life, and that was part of my adventure, but also a good death. And we discussed with my brother dying just a few months beforehand, which was such a shock and a surprise, yeah. that, that whenever my death comes, I'm going to make it in stoic fashion a good death. Um, and to 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 face it in whatever way i have to because i know i'm going to die so why not make it the case yeah. and then the the third area was a, a, a personal one ar- around improving my health uh which has improved but i still haven't cracked yet the deep sleep i'm working on the d- okay. deep sleep i still i still but that was a a, a subtext but the the health has improved and and the plant-based medicine did help so thank you for that wow um Good. Say more about intentions, people's intentions yeah. and how yeah. important that is. Well, our life, we're taught, <clears throat> society teaches us to look at the outcomes, like, you know, expectations of an outcome, uh, you know, set a goal for a specific outcome, uh, set an action plan, reverse engineer, so you can have a specific outcome, right? Well, yeah. what happens when you focus on a specific outcome is that you're missing the most important ingredients of an outcome, and that is the world around you. You know, people put their head to the grindstone. You've heard it, hustle and grind. All you're doing is putting your eyes on the ground in front of you and you see nothing that's happened on the outside. And if you ask any, any super wealthy person, they'll say, you know, 40 to 60% of what happened was luck and coincidence and luck and coincidence doesn't happen in front of you. It happens, it happens in your peripheral. All right. So that's why uh, when we say, you know, the plant medicine is something that allows you to embrace your peripheral um, and receive what's, you know, you know, for me, an intention it can be tangible and it can be intangible. It can be spiritual. It can be, you know, sort of logical. And so that's the beauty of it. You can mix and mix and mix and match. But in the end, 
when you focus on the intention and you take that imperfect action and co-creating the world around you as you go, um, and you're not focused on the outcome, uh, you end up being more powerful. Uh, you have more solutions at ready at hand and you're attracting people at that frequency of the intention focus and not an outcome. The how doesn't matter. How, how am I going to get there? It doesn't matter when you're certain of your ability to deploy your genius in any given situation that the world throws at you. Um, then that certainty carries you further than any plan ever could. Right. I'm not saying don't have a plan. I'm just saying it carries you further because the plan is like a road, but you're looking and you're seeing and you're receiving. And I break it down to three things, three things in life. Like this is life, three things in one decision, receive what's in front of you, decide what to do with it, make a decision and then let everything go. that doesn't serve you. That's life. And the one decision we got to make, Jonathan, is do I really want to be happy? Not, yeah, if I want to be happy. Do you really want to be happy? What's the unequivocal decision that you can make right now to decide that for the rest of your life, you're going to be happy? Because let's face it, we're all born and we're all going to die. And we have a choice in between those two times to enjoy life. That's, that's basically life. Mm. You know? I, I think beautifully put. And, and particularly... I think during my time on the retreat, um, I was very clear that I do want to be happy. And indeed, I am very happy. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that was um, some people go and they're trying to find, you know, a new partner or what to do with their career um, and what next in life or yeah. some, some big existential questions, you know, or how can they get over deep depression or PTSD? Uh, actually, mine was a, a reaffirmation of how lucky I am. Uh, of what I already have and that I am already happy and contented. It, it really was a reaffirmation. Looking and, at and what you have and not what you don't have. Correct. And you and I ran on mile one of the Inca Trail, um, uh, even though we were about 11,500 feet, and, and it was sunk. It, it had dry stone walls and it was sunk by about four foot, but it was beautifully grassed and down the hill. And, and to me, that's a bit of a metaphor, like you're saying. And, and I think both at the event, and uh, one of your colleagues, the one from Germany, said um, about you know not being so goal obsessed, but yeah. actually being on the journey. And I think even since then, I've become less goal obsessed and more about the experience in the moment and, and what's going on for me, yeah. however long I've got. And, and the final thought before I pass back over to you was that um, th this, this whole idea of of being present, being in the motion, in the in in the moment. Uh, the other one was particularly about control, and yeah. you talked about letting go of control. Control is a big issue for me. Yeah. Uh, I think it is for many people, but but I think being able to let go of control while I was there, and being more aware of it now, not needing to be in control, is is powerful. Where does control come from? It comes from fear of some outcome, hmm. right? So. Um, let go of the outcome. Like I said, don't worry about the outcome. Focus on the intention. That'll, that'll take the fear away. And fear, not, fear does not exist in the present moment. Fear exists through the memories of the past that are programming your, your vision or your thoughts about what's going to happen in the future, the anxiety. That's where fear, fear doesn't exist in the moment. So if you know that and you live in the moment, you'll never be fearful. It's, it's, it's a powerful thing when you, when you realize that we, we, we literally control our destiny through... Um, you know, through our minds and our minds is not our consciousness. Um, the mind is separate from the consciousness. A mind, the mind is a chatterbox. It's programmed by the world around us. And it's, um, it's, it's programmed. So you have emotional programmed, emotional reactions to things that they take your experiences from the past and what you've heard and what you were taught. And it projects them into the future when something happens. And that's just pure, that's just building fear for no reason. Yeah, it, it, you, it, I'm smiling as you're talking about the mind and it's a chatterbox. I've been listening to Dr. Abin, who has Abin Clinics. It's all about brain health. A uh, very interesting American uh, doctor and, and also sort of into psychology as well. And he said, you've got to give your brain a name. It's, it's almost as if it's a, a third person. So my brain's called Humphrey. And, 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 like, and Humphrey, like, Humphrey, what the hell are you doing? Just, yeah. just chill out, man. You know, I love just, it. Just, like, stop interrupting. I'm just being present at the moment. Just stop worrying about what's going to yeah. go wrong. And let's just enjoy beautiful view. I'm, you know, before I came here, just out in the garden, uh, planting some shrubs and things like that. We've got the Queen's Jubilee going on at the moment. And, and 
if you give it a name, in my case, a hilarious name, like Humphrey. I mean, yeah. it's so, so ridiculous, you have to laugh. It's so so very British, you know, like Humphrey. Yeah, said, Humphrey. Humphrey. Yeah, what, right. what are you doing, Humphrey? You can be and, like Winston or something. <laughs> that's right. Winston, yeah. <laughs> Just because he kicks off sometimes and does things yeah. and you go, what did you do there? What yeah. was that all but- about? But just that, that just the, uh, even without the name, just the ability to realize that that's happening, you are light years ahead of most of society. Yeah. You are not light your years. mind. You yeah. are not your mind. You're not your mind. No. You're not your mind. No. And uh, it, it is so interesting, the sort of pre-programming and the things that we do, the dragons that get unleashed, that come up, that someone just steps on your dragon and off it goes. And you go, yeah. what, what happened there? And yeah. their dragon then fights back yep. and so it goes on. I, I quite like that. Plant-based medicine. Let's talk about plant-based medicine yes. because as one of my wonderful friends in the Royal Air Force said, Jonathan, you, know, such, you realize that's class A drugs you're taking with this ayahuasca. I said, it's not in Peru. It's just, it's a it's a ceremony oh, yeah. that's gone on for thousands of years. Yeah, exactly. So we, we did two. One was ayahuasca and one was San Pedro. San Pedro. Tell people though, who don't know about San Pedro yeah. what, what they both are. Okay, so um, the ayahuasca is a divine feminine plant. It's a, it's a, it's a, a vine and a root that are mixed together. Um, and you take that in the evening, right? Then you have San Pedro, which is a cactus, and that's the divine masculine. Some call it the grandfather, the father, and they call ayahuasca the mother or the grandmother. And we have three ceremonies of San Pedro two, and one ceremony of ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is, if you will, the feminine. So how, how, do, how do feminine um, human beings think? They typically think holistically. You know how a man's action-oriented. Like, like maybe I have a problem, you know, and you're like, okay, what do I need to do to fix it? And all you really need to do is listen because a holistic person is a uh, stand backish kind of person and looks at the whole picture. So the, uh, the ayahuasca, when you ingest the ayahuasca, you have a vision session, if you will. And so it's very holistic, very, uh, for a lot of people, very feel very many pictures and colors and, and things like that. But you really, you know, a lot of people stay with ayahuasca, but there's, there's, there's a way you need to implement that. And that's what we do six or eight hours later we go into the San Pedro, which is the action orientation. So you have the holistic, the plan, the thoughts, the visions, and then you take the San Pedro, work with the San Pedro, and that grounds you and gives you the tools that you need to achieve the holistic vision that you had. And so that's why we mix it in this way. Most people don't mix it that way. And we work with the Keshua tribe. The Keshua tribe are the last descendants of the Incan empire. There's like a thousand of them left. Um, and you were there, you met, you met Luis and Juan, you know, there were some fantastic guys. Uh, and that allows us to keep this, the sacred sort of aspects of the, of the ceremony there. And it's not just like some Westerners taking some medicine. And it's very important for us that we, we connect to Pachamama, we connect to the earth, we connect to uh, the space around us through the ceremonies. And then we had, of course, a despacho, which is the intention, an intention ceremony where we burned the intentions up in smoke and like it's done. Yeah. Mm. So that's, that's pretty much plant. There's a bunch more plant medicine. There's Bufo 5 MEO DMT. There's Iboga. There's, you know, you name it, just pe- 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 peyote, mushrooms, psilocybin, all that kind of stuff. Mm. But we, we stick with those two. Yeah. And you've, you know, you're experiencing different stuff where you're in uh, Croatia yeah. in your, your island there. There's a whole, a whole range uh, more to do, but just touch on some of the, the key points in the itinerary of what we did. Um, Cause it yeah. was, it was quite sure. ac- action packed, but yeah, the, the lovely thing about it was, there were certain events, but there was space enough yeah. to listen to each other, to talk, to wander around, to go through the sacred uh, ground that was nearby and reflect and think and be on your own and sleep. And uh, it, it was nicely paced, actually. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we try to do it that way because we, we don't want it to be that. Well, you got to have like a schedule and you got to, you know, not that at all. We had like flexible breakfast, flexible lunch, flexible dinner if we ever had it. Uh, you know, it would come when it came kind of thing, you know, and uh, so our itinerary was real simple. We show up, have a climatation day. Then we uh, do our first session of, of, of Pedro in the next morning, allow that to sink in, let it go, take a day break. Uh, this time, I think we went to Machu Picchu first. Uh, on the way there, we went to the animal sanctuary. We went to Pizac, Olentombiando, Agua de Galentes, and uh, Machu Picchu through a bus and then a train and then another bus. So it was basically... Um, through the edge of the Amazon as we went in on the train to uh, to Machu Picchu, Agua de Galentes. And what that does is you have your first ceremony or two, 
and you're very, and you're, you're, you're in this compound and you're next to the temple, the moon temple, the frog temple, the monkey, all these temples, and you're in this very small space. And then for the integration phase after that, that's why we go out and travel. That's why we go see the condor. That's why we go to Pisac and Olento Miando and Algo de Galantes and Machu Picchu, because now you're expanding your consciousness, allowing what you just focused on to integrate into your mind and into your soul. So now you're reacting different to the world around you and you're getting tangible results immediately. Like you feel the difference. And then we go back to the, to the ceremonies and we do the ayahuasca and then the San Pedro the next morning. And then one more page right, right, right before we leave. Uh, a trip to Cusco is always included. Like, you know, if you want to go down the mountain, uh, we're at, what was it? 11,000 feet or something. And then I think Cusco is 3,000 feet below that or 4,000 feet below that. Um, and so you go down there and, you know, you look at the city, get some souvenirs, that kind of stuff. So we have a whole range, but it's not tight knit. Like sometimes half the group went there and half of them did this. And some of them did this and some of them did that. Uh, and that's, that's the whole point of it. And Lane and I were participants, you know, my business partner, and I, we're, we're participants. So we don't, all right, this is what we're going to do. It's like, everyone knows the itinerary. We have a loose schedule. Let's roll with it. And so we're one of you. We're all one. We're all, we're all the same. And it's, it's fabulous. Man. It really is. Yeah, and that was um, really nice, the way that you were participants. It was a very gentle bit of guidance. Um, and, and as you say, we had the local uh, Inca descendants who were there with the condor, um, the condor wings and feathers and some of the ceremonies and the dispatcher where you let the stuff go in the flames. It was very sacred, very special, but yet also very educational very grounding so thank you for that um one of the things which is always a uh one for us all to learn is boundaries and you and i talked of this and that you know when we're all involved in it and, and go th these ceremonies people go through some quite um amazing experiences quite mind-altering in some ways or unleashes some stuff i mean the ayahuasca ceremony is called the purge um because some people are quietly uh, and politely sick um, because stuff comes up for them. Um, and so it is, it is quite a hard one. What was, what was your learning on boundaries and how to manage boundaries? Good question. You know, there's, there was an episode there where there was a lack of a boundary set because we were all on the medicine. Mm. And that, that then uh, morphed into a discussion which morphed into um, a profound, um, a profound shift for me in the way that I uh, am with my partner. Yeah. Right. And or the female mm. portion of my life, uh, and it, it was profound. And that, and that's the beauty of the medicine is it doesn't matter who the leader is, right? Everybody learns. You know, everybody can learn. Put it that way. Mm. So yeah, it's um, it's it was it was it was quite profound. Yeah, and we talked. In depth about that yeah. yeah and there were a number of profound things and thank you for for saying that i think that was a, a really good insight for you but but also for all of us um in that for example people would say things to you and you weren't expecting them to make that kind of comment you know one of my comments my father used to have was don't die with the music still in you and he was killed when i was two and a half and uh, and i have been rather thinking that if David had died so quickly, maybe my life was due to end soon as well. But actually one of the participants, out of the blue, she said, Jonathan, she said, you got a lot of dancing still in you. And, and, and it was a lovely comment, it was the lady from Kuwait. And, and I thought that is very profound for me yeah, because I have got so much more to do and, and I don't want to die with the music still in me and I will be more present, but I have a, a global calling, this idea of inspiring, it's back to my intention to inspire leadership in the world. And, and so, as you say, we had the ayahuasca, which in my particular case, I, I could see the stars and I felt like I was up with the stars. You know? And I suppose in some ways, the metaphor me is that I work with stars like you and others who, who are very successful in their own area of the constellation of the, of the planet but yet I'm comfortable being alongside these stars. And, but that I have to get my, uh, my message out into the world and, and not to just sit back and quietly yeah. things. I have to push myself beyond the comfort zone. Yeah. And so, you know, as you say, for the San Pedro, I, I, it, 
came really clearly as a series of milestones. Went, These are the things I'm going to do in the next two or three years. Yeah. You know, one is I'm going to, I am going to, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I am going to write my third book, CEOs and Teams Inspire Leadership. I'm going to do that. I'm going to record it as an audio book. I'm going to help Lee as she's going to write her book, Toxic Teams. Um, we're going to do the next uh, iteration of our psychometric, uh, which we're going to do. And then the thing that I hadn't expected was this amazing coincidence that goes on when you're at a place like this. And it's not a surprise. A coincidence, it's supposed to be two things meeting. Yeah. But that, you know, I got to know an email during the ceremony, during yeah. the San Pedro, as I was just taking a few notes about my milestones, in came a note saying, like you to attend the, uh, to become certified as a world-class speaker coach. And I went, wow, that's exactly what, I hadn't heard from this guy for five years and it came in just then. And I went, yep. yes, I'm doing it. And so on the 12th of, or the 14th of June, I started a 12 week program uh, nice. to train other people nice. to become world-class coaches. So I think it was really uh, profound that, that uh, holistic bit of seeing yourself, you know, in my particular case, I could see that everything was much brighter. All the colors were enhanced, even in the dark, it sort of came out. Yeah. But that, that, that uh, galactical uh, stellar sort of star thing. And then the, the itinerary of a milestone it, it came i don't know about about you for for your own experiences yeah it's the same it's the same like i said it's the whole the holistic sort of a plan sort of a vague or you know picture oriented how do you put it together how do you take action how do you make it happen well that's what pedro does and as you saw uh you set your intention and sometimes you get immediate immediate answers i had a very important question that i needed clarity on uh and my intention was to find clarity in this question and that was you know, it had to do with my current situation with my separated wife. And, uh, I, you know, we were pinballing back and forth for seven or eight months. And I asked the question, and just like you, in that very moment, I got a text message from her. And it made the answer so clear to me that I decided on the spot. Mm. And on the spot, sent an email to take action. So um, that's the holistic to the tangible. Mm. That's why it's so important that you work with the, the ayahuasca to open up and then the San Pedro to take action. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, think, I think it was very clear. And the other thing is uh, I spoke about earlier and a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Niswitz, who does a number of leadership retreats in America. Uh, Jeff's a very fine coach. He said that, let me ask you three questions. Uh, what, what clarity did you gain in Peru that you didn't have before? Uh, what did you leave in Peru yeah. And, and what should you have left in Peru that you didn't leave in Peru? Uh, and, and that was a very good framework for me. To, I hadn't thought of it that way, but, uh, yeah. uh, but I, uh, I, the clarity I had is that, I think I said to you, I am living my life on purpose, that I'm really happy with my wife, Lee, my marriage, the children, the work that Lee and I do. Uh, and then I now know the next steps I need to do with the business and, and what I do going forward in the next few years. So, so that was wonderful clarity that um, the plant-based medicine gave me. Uh, what I left in Peru was any bitterness with uh, previous people who I might have been a bit bitter about in my life um, and forgiveness. I, I think I, I, I gave that forgiveness and so therefore I could move on. Um, the sadness over my brother's death and, and also that, that intense need for control um, and, and, uh, and holding back because yeah. I was trying to be in control. I think that was what I left in Peru. And then what I didn't leave in Peru that I brought back was um, still there's that element of judgment uh, when I see somebody else, the gap between myself and other people, whether I think I'm more than or less than them, um, maybe even a little bit judgmental. It's okay to be discerning, but not to be judgmental is my view. And then how much I enjoy finding peers people who um, like you and I can have a great conversation and it's at fast pace, yeah. but you know that you're both learning from each other. That was, that's uh, what I, I, I continue to enjoy finding peers and that I, I, I learn and, and know that I'm still competitive and comparative, but probably less so now than I was before. And, and also my final thought about what I needed to leave into Peru, uh, which I didn't, is my expectations and my attachment to other people and how they should behave or how they should look or how they should look after their health yeah. and their well-being and they're not doing and yeah. why aren't they doing that 
And so that's work. That's work in progress. We're always until, until the day we die. We're always exactly. Work Hopefully, in yeah. Because when we stop working, we're done. We're dead. Yeah. It's yeah, simple as that. Yeah. You know, the expectations are a funny thing. You know, we have, we have in our humble alpha in the book, Unleash Humble Alpha, we talk about expectations and how you either have an expectation and you agree upon it with somebody or you don't have an expectation at all. And if you do that, you'll never be disappointed. It's a simple, it's, it's everything breaks down. Life actually always breaks down into those simple solutions, you know, like, you know, receive, decide, let go, decide you want to be happy, you know, and <laughs> You know, creating all, all these things that we talk about and we boil it down to the simplest uh, thing and you you what you just described that you can even sit there and articulate what you left there what you brought back and what you should have left there that you can even articulate that shows a, a massive clarity in in your life and just that alone if you ask anybody anybody right now what do you want they go uh you know what i mean you know what you want mm -hmm. that your head and shoulders above the rest of the world that way yeah. And it doesn't mean you're better. No, no. Just, you're you're more prepared and willing to, to willing to make that little extra bit of effort, so you know where the hell you're going, so you can make a bigger impact. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it really is that simple. It's just we get we get our mind right takes us away. You got to do this. Mom said that. Dad said that. Outside world says this. This is what you're supposed to do when you're in this position. This is what you're supposed to wear. Like all this stuff. You know, the outside world doesn't matter. When it comes to judgment, though, there's a saying: if it's out there, it's in here. So if I'm judging somebody, uh, it's because it's in me. Whatever yeah. I see, I don't like about me or whatever I see annoys me about me or whatever I see, I like about me, whatever it is. If it's out there, it's in here. If I see it, it's because I have it. And that's a, that's a real simple way to catch yourself going like, wait a second. Like I was driving here to Croatia and I was, I was going pretty fast and uh, a guy pulled out in front of me because he was behind a truck. And I was like, God dang it. You know, and then I thought, wait a second, I'd have done the same thing. Like I'd have done the same, I'd have pulled out and I'm like, well, so I waved and I'm like, sorry, dude. You know, <laughs> you know, like when you catch yourself in those moments, that learning that you go through and that split second that you stop yourself from carrying on with that emotional sort of judgment kind of thing, uh, it's, it's, it's like quantum leaps in, in growth. So, right. And, and, and that's very profound for me, this, this, uh, having fewer expectations. There's some expectations of yourself, but of course. But um, this thing that to, to love and be comfortable with who I am, this, uh, this whole idea of self-love without ego, that um, you are the limit you are for other people. So if you don't like yourself very much, you cannot like others more than that. If you, you bring the bar very low. So if you're able to have much more love and kindness and respect to yourself, you'll do the same with other people too. They all lift on the rising tide. Well, I, I think it's really important. Well, it's it's not only important. It's it's to the degree that you love, accept, and embrace yourself is to the degree that you will ever allow yourself to receive love, embracing, and uh, you know accepting yourself. If 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 I don't like my if I if I like myself, let's to, just to give it a you know a, a quantify it. If I like myself fifty percent, and I have a partner that loves me, accepts me, and wants to you know dive into me more than that fifty percent, what 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 do we usually do? it's not you it's me we can't do this like you're pushing them away mm -hmm. and so it's it's very important to love yourself accept yourself and embrace yourself it's probably the most important thing at all when it comes to any kind of output in life because you will always stop people when they get to that point where you are mm -hmm. always that's just the receiving part and of course you can't give more either so yeah yeah and without going into too much very personal detail in those three categories uh the clarity you gained what you left behind in Peru and what you should have left in Peru, but you brought home with you yeah. and, and now to this Croatian island. How, what would you, how would you answer for those three categories for yourself? Well, I got to tell you light speed, man. Um, one was about my separated wife and my new partner. So I had two different um, massive clarity with that um, with myself when it comes to how I am with, my partner mm -hmm. that was massive clarity that's what i took away right the clarity part and then i took away that part there's, there's a bunch more but these are the important ones right now and what i should have left there um you know i still have that 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 issue of not feeling good enough you know what i mean like not doing what i know i can do not having the impact that i know that i'm capable of i should just leave that there because once you let that go you have it right and i'm a certain guy 
like I'm very certain in, in my abilities to deploy my genius in any given situation. That's just who I am. Uh, yet still, you do something and you're finished and you're like, I could have been better. Like, I, I could have been better. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can, it can, it can lead to detrimental sort of uh, situations and thoughts and processes and stuff. So I probably should have left that there to keep it simple. I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff too, but let's keep it like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a really good point. I mean, you and I in, the, in, the, in our days in, in the US Army and in the British Army, we'd always have what some call an after action review. When you, you, you did the event, what worked well, what would have made it even better? And, and I think that's still a healthy process for you and I, you know, in the way you run the event, what went well, what would have made it even better for next time, just to, to constantly yeah. just yeah. iterate and, and just, you know, Kanban, just constant improvement, make it just slightly better than it was before. Uh, which I think is a bit about our legacy. You know, it's about stewardship, leaving things better than we found them. And, um, uh, and, and this is why, you know, you've got a lot of music still in you, which you, you mustn't die with it in you. And, and you've got some amazing ambitions and drives and things you're going to do. A lot, of, a lot of, you know, really ambitious projects that you're going to do. And I think, you know, keep going, Stephen, you know, because you've made a huge difference to that eclectic mix of, of oddballs of all of us that, that yeah. you know, from all over the world. Uh, and, and it really, again, reminded me never to judge the book by the cover because with every single person that I met there, they would present themselves in a certain way. And you'd go, I'd love to know what's behind yeah. that. Why are they behaving in that certain way? I'm sure that's not what's really going on behind there. And once you got to know them and they opened up, a, and of course the whole ceremony allowed people to open up. And the fact that, uh, that with the exception of you and Leigh, who, who knew each other and you knew some of the people because uh, everybody was a connection through you, um, many of them didn't know each other. I certainly didn't know anybody else apart from you two. And that was only because you'd been guests on the, uh, the podcast before. Um, it, it, it allowed us to, to see a side of people that we could then feed back to them. This is how yeah. we're experiencing you. Yeah. What does this mean? Or yeah. I noticed this. I'm curious about this. What about that? Yeah, I did that to you and you did that to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very helpful. Very. And, helpful. and to be able to receive that, to be able to take that and process it and talk it out, that's powerful. I mean, that doesn't, doesn't, that doesn't typically happen in the normal world, if you know what I mean. Yeah. No, you know, the, no. the, the, the stage isn't set for that kind of um, re re accepting. You know, when you're at work and you're like, Hey man, uh, this is what I'm seeing. And, and why is it like that? And you're like, what, what, what are you talking about? Man? You know, it's like you get defensive, yeah. but when you're out there and you've been there for a couple of days, cause you know, we got to take each other, get to know each other and you get to more and more time in those little groups and then people switch and it's like, everyone gets to know each other and then you can be honest and everyone is at the same place. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, that, that leads us rather nicely. And I just like to stay on air just after um, we finish recording, we'll have a bit more of a chat, but, I think it brings us nicely to the to the end of it. Um, and if I could go first and let you have the last word uh, to appreciate something about you. Um, I certainly appreciate that you came into my life and through through hearing you on Clubhouse and then I invited you as a guest and you were a fabulous guest um, that you made me have such a great experience, a life enhancing experience in Peru. Um, and also the insights that you have given me, uh, which were very personal and yeah. very helpful to me. I, I'm just incredibly grateful to that. So that's my appreciation of you, Stephen, and the, the role you have in the world to, uh, to, to help others too. Thank you, Jonathan. You know, I mean, I, uh, you know, I was, I didn't, I, I, we hit it off when we met, you know, we just had this connection um, when we met on the podcast. And then in person, um, it was just, it was like, okay, here's two warriors coming together you know and uh, it was it was um i i appreciate your directness and the way that you are able to say things directly without uh the emotional hurt or uh, en bad energy behind it you know you're yeah. very good you're very very articulate and very very good at that because it's, it's the energy behind the words that matter yeah right and you have a very welcoming and empathetic uh, energy behind what you say and how you do it well, and uh, I mean that's I, I just when we were on Machu Picchu we took that picture where I was saluting we were saluting each other I just I had to do that you know it's like this is like this is my brother you know it's just 
Yeah, so beautiful thing, man. I really appreciate that. No, uh, I appreciate it too. And and so Stephen Kuhn, thank you very much. You know, unleash your humble alpha, the retreat in Peru. What an experience it was. And thank you for that, for me and for others. And I wish you every success. Thank you, sir. You as well. <laughs>